All right. Good afternoon. Thank you for coming after the almost the end of the conference. You got like what two more talks. So I'm here to talk to you about forking. Um, how many of you have ever forked software before? Okay. How many of you have maybe used fork software before? Okay. How many of you like forking software? <laughs> okay. So I, I have some experience with forking software. Um, I, I, I forked uh, MySQL when we founded MariaDB server. But um, that's not the only experience I have with forking software. Um, because um, OpenOffice eventually also ended up having a fork called LibreOffice. And actually, that fork was kind of an easy fork because there was something called OBuild for Linux users. So uh, there's a lot of experience around uh, forking. Um, a rough, quick agenda uh, around what I will be talking about. Because forks mean different things to different people. Does everybody here use GitHub? Who doesn't use GitHub? How about that? OK. So that's a picture of a fork. So it, in software engineering, a fork is basically you take an existing code base. It's a very weighty decision. And uh, you can definitely um, you know, force many parties that are reliant on the software to choose between one or the other. And this is very true in many things, like you know, today, MySQL. Um, and uh, MariaDB. It's also very true from a LibreOffice, uh, OpenOffice standpoint, and so forth. But to the GitHub generation, forking means something else completely. For one, when you start something, people, people, the maintainers, they sort of appreciate that uh, you've done some good work. It's kind of like a bookmark. Uh, then they also encourage you to fork software, but that is not a typical software fork that I'm going to talk about. Forking software is basically you making a repository, making changes, and then um, asking submitting a pull request. So this is more uh, a workflow, and GitHub just calls it uh, a fork. The first open source fork that I could actually track is actually Postgres. Um, it's when Michael Stonebreaker decided he wanted something after Ingress, and uh, today Postgres is what is probably what you're familiar with, called PostgreSQL. So the first probably known fork was a in the open source world was a database. But maybe probably one of the um, better known forks is uh, GNU Emacs and XEmacs. Anybody here use Emacs? OK. Um, this one really actually split an open source community. Uh, it also touched end users. So um, when, I, when Postgres forked um, from Ingress, it really wasn't a you know very end user end usable stuff, but Emacs ha had a nice uh, UI and stuff, and it had many many code branches. And this is just a snapshot of those code branches. Um, this comes from a, a guy called Jamie Zawinski who made uh, Lucid Emacs, and uh, it's it's so big it can't even fit on a slide. And he's actually made a Emacs timeline. So if you Google JWZ Emacs timeline, you get Jamie Zawinski, Zawinski's Emacs timeline, and uh, Generally speaking, forks take a really long time to play out. In the case of Emacs and XEmacs, it played out from 1991 all the way up to 2015. Timelines here, 24 years before one one over the other. When it comes to copyright assignment as well as contributor license agreements, many open source projects have them. The Free Software Foundation definitely sees this as important. Uh, and necessary for them to defend the code against GPL violations. Um, whereas the ex Emacs developers for a long time argued that the lack of a copyright assignment was what allowed major companies to get involved, hence the you know, formation of Lucid and so forth. And it allowed sometimes companies to license code back. And so one of the major reasons to fork had, had to be around copyright assignment. And uh, maybe if you contribute to open source projects today, you may also end up uh, occasionally having to sign a contributor agreement, which many people do, but many corporations find it maybe hard to do. So the last stable release of XEmacs came out in January of 2009. They always thought there would be a need for compatibility at the Lisp level. So Lisp is a language that you get inside of Emacs. And uh, there are a whole bunch of third-party packages, like people use Emacs to read email, and uh, they just moved directly back into the Emacs tree. Then it turns out the reason forks sort of disappear is that you end up getting feature parity. So once, X, once Emacs had feature parity to pretty much everything X Emacs had as, as um, an enhancement, 
they realized they were at a crossroads and there was probably not much reason for X E Max to continue development. So that sort of stopped in December of 2015. And I think if you go and try to go to xemax.org today even, that domain does not even um, resolve any longer. MySQL is definitely the world's most popular open source database. Um, there's an, another track downstairs, I think in the, on the second floor, it's where we've been. It started in May 1995. It's now many, many years old. It has a huge history. MySQL didn't start off as GPL software. It was not really licensed. It was sort of in the public domain, but you had to pay for, um, say, binaries on Solaris and on Windows. Since the idea was, hey, you already paid for the OS, you might as well pay for all the software. But MySQL then became GPL in 2000. And uh, dual licensing was definitely popularized by MySQL because the uh, libraries uh, were also made GPLs uh, and you get a copyright assignment sent to the company so the company actually owned, owned the code. But it, wasn't the f it was definitely not invented there because GoScript had it before as well. InnoDB Friday happened uh, in 2005. Oracle grabbed the IP of the most important storage engine for MySQL, the, the engine that made MySQL transactional and not a toy database. So the first ever Maria project started actually back in MySQL days itself in late 2005. And the reason was because InnoBase had already been acquired. The idea was let's make another storage engine called Maria to basically be a transactional MyISM. Has everybody here used MySQL before? Who has not used MySQL before? OK, so you're familiar with storage engines, MyISAM, InnoDB, and so forth. So Maria was actually started off as a, as a project to be an engine. So we, f we, we, we fast forward a little bit. And uh, there, there were other forks inside of um, MySQL as well. So this is a good example of one that started while MySQL was acquired by Sun called Drizzle. Drizzle doesn't exist anymore. Well, then there are many other branches as well. So to give you an idea of how long it takes for a fork to get started, the first beta release of a, of a, of a server started in October of 2009. And many of us were already working on the Maria project. So back then, we used to use, we went from BitKeeper to uh, Bazaar and Launchpad and now we use Git and, and GitHub. So it took a fairly long time before we could sort of make a fork just, just ready because we already had a tree, a base tree that we could use. So the one thing that MariaDB sort of wanted to do right afterwards was to ensure that there was a foundation formed. To en this would mean that if the corporation ever got acquired, probably will have to get acquired, uh, this would mean that at least the software code remains open source. So you don't make the same mistakes of MySQL again. SkySQL was, was a company that ra has totally raised nearly 100 million in VC funding. So we, uh, we fully expect that the company MariaDB Corporation has to get acquired because they bought um, MariaDB and they renamed the company to become MariaDB. If you're going to fork, you want to make sure you have a story. This is the story that managed to get people to use MariaDB from MySQL. We would go to trade shows and tell people, hey, if you've, used, if you've heard of MySQL, you must hear about MariaDB. Hey, we're the new Emin Lamp, even though maybe people don't use the Lamp stack anymore. And this was, this was the original goal for the project. And of course, it didn't hurt that the competitors from MariaDB, the project overlords, were Oracle. People, for some absurd reason, have an aversion to Oracle. They have bad memories for some reason, or perceived memories. But Oracle's been great. So make sure it's community developed, right? Participate in Google Summer of Code. Um, take stuff from other people, because smart people are everywhere but, but in one, one place. And that's something that MySQL has never really managed to do so much. MySQL used to do this before um, the Sun acquisition, but never after. We also wanted to make sure it was available everywhere. So our, our logic was, look, if our fork is going to be utilized, we must replace MySQL in Linux distributions. So we worked really hard to replace MySQL in every Linux distribution possible. 
because we were at that point in time backwards compatible. But today, when MariaDB is completely a fork and, and there are two different competing features, I guess Linux distribution sort of realized that you have to offer both MySQL and MariaDB because they're two different products. But when we started, we were just a drop-in replacement. This is also, you can take a page out of the cloud providers. When you go to Amazon RDS, you actually get to install MySQL or MariaDB. You don't get to, you don't get to, get to say, hey, it's MariaDB, that's actually MySQL. We also care about usage, right? Usage really matters. And OpenStack, every six months, runs the survey, and it tells you what kind of usage uh, patterns you're getting. And if you're making a fork and you're not getting users, then you're, then you're probably forking for the wrong reason. Fork, forking without users is kind of useless. Of course, in the MySQL world, there are a whole bunch of branches and forks. And people want to maybe migrate between them. Now, if you could compare this to other things like, say, LibreOffice, it may be a bit easier because the file format at least stays the same between LibreOffice and OpenOffice. But it's not necessarily true when it comes to uh, database features. So, so when you come to a fork in the road, uh, maybe you should take it. Um, sometimes you can backport fi fixes. So when you, when you fork something, you may think, I can, do a, I can do a merge and add features. Or sometimes you cherry pick features. The merge and add features way is way easier and way maintainable over a long period of time compared to the whole, let's cherry pick because you'll miss stuff out during a cherry pick. And that's guaranteed. So generally speaking, from an engineering standpoint, um, I highly recommend that you, you think more of a branch than a, than a hard fork. Because forking, is, uh, forking becomes very expensive from an engineering standpoint as well. Uh, of course, this also means that you've got to get rid of the not invented here syndrome that people tend to have when they want to do a fork. They say, you know, you shouldn't look at, you shouldn't look at something and say, oh, you know, they've, they've written that feature and it looks kind of odd. I can do it, you know, 5% better. Because the reality is, if you, even if you write infrastructure software and you can get 5% better performance, how many people run their infrastructure, how many people would benefit from that if you're looking for a user base? Probably not as many as you think. Also, when you fork something, like in the case of Drizzle, there are two things one could learn from them. One is, you nev when you make a fork, you don't be aggressive. You make it easy for people to migrate to your fork. Because if you make it such that you can't even migrate, say, a WordPress, a, a fairly simple schema, a database schema like WordPress, to run from MySQL to say Drizzle. You, can't, you don't even allow WordPress to just be ported over directly because you've decided to be standards compliant and remove features like a medium int, for example, because the standard doesn't include things like a medium int. And you want to be ANSI SQL compliant. That turns users away because if you're, not, if you're not easy to use, people are like, we don't want to touch you. Also, Drizzle think, will teach you something else about making a fork. If you all work in one company and you're the only people contributing to said fork, if that company changes its ideas, like in the case of Drizzle, they said, hey, you should go work on OpenStack. Rackspace is not interested in a database anymore. Then, then, then the project dies. So this is something else you need to think about when you, when you decide to go out there and uh, choose software that you're going to use. So LibreOffice, they forked in uh, late 2010. It's, it, you know, it started its life as StarOffice, Sun, Sun purchased that and then had an open office project around, around it. But the, the fork was actually made very possible by the fact that there was something called OOO Build, which started by Michael Meeks of then Zimian and Novell, now Collabra. And the goal was to make it easy to build on Linux. OOO Build was a way to make open office build easily across all Linux distributions. And that's how Red Hat managed to contribute to it. Um, the, of course, the Zimian folk did, and a whole bunch of other people. Sun even made commercial agreements with people like IBM. So IBM's Lotus Symphony was actually based on um, Open Office. How did, how did that manage to happen when you make a commercial agreement? That's because every time you contributed to Open Office as a community member, you signed a contributor license agreement. And that's probably one of those bonuses of having a CLA. However, OpenOffice.org languished while it was um, at Oracle. So LibreOffice sort of just took over. And by the time it was too late, I think Oracle decided to give it to the Apache Foundation. And um, by the end of, so, by the end of uh, maybe uh, third quarter of 2016, 
the Apache project realized there were just lack of active developers or contributors that it didn't make much more sense to continue open office. And today, if you start needing to use software, you probably just use LibreOffice. But there's so many others. When it came to Nagios and Isinga, Nagios decided to take a more commercial path. This is monitoring software. And it took 10 years for a fork to, to appear called Isinga. Uh, it started first off as a hobby. Nagios started off as a hobby, like most open source projects. Then they maybe decide to make money, obviously. Then people say, hey, maybe we should in get investor money. And then investors usually say, look, we we're happy to give you money, but within 10 years, you've got to give us like 10 times back the money. Very hard to do with open source. Nagios was serious about trademarks. Slowed, very, very slow development on the open source project led to the creation of Isinga. Both now have active communities. Though Google uh, Trends, of course, suggest that if you use that, that Isinga probably needs to work harder at marketing. OpenSSL and LibreSSL. Maybe a few years ago, some of you may remember this vulnerability. And uh, they aimed to actually start refactoring code to make a more secure implementation. OpenSSL at that stage, and probably even now, still needs better funding. Because it's a critical piece of in internet infrastructure. And the Linux Foundation decided to found a core infrastructure initiative to make that happen. The whole Node.js and IOJS fork was, was, was very short-lived, largely because they, it was a governance issue. They needed a, an open foundation to help with more development. No, no one in the community wanted just one single company to actually control active development. At that point in time, Joint was actually pushing Node.js uh, fairly heavily. Joint was then acquired by Samsung. So the Node.js Foundation ended up being part of a Linux Foundation umbrella organization. Everything's good. No, no reason to fork. Probably today you don't even hear about IOJS any longer. Hudson and Jenkins. So again, uh, not to pick on Oracle, but they seem to actually generate good forks. Oracle basically said there's a trademark assertion on Hudson. Um, so the community decided to vote, change the name to, to Jenkins. And um, Oracle basically said Jenkins is now a fork. They will continue de de developing Hudson. And, but Jenkins today, I guess, is probably way, way, way more famous. There are still security patches that we see that are being pushed to Hudson. Hudson eventually got donated to the Eclipse Foundation, probably to rest in peace, just like OpenOffice. So again, not to pick on Oracle. They're doing an excellent job with MySQL. In fact, they're probably running most of the talks in the track downstairs. And MySQL keeps on getting better. Own cloud and xCloud. This one just bizarre. The corporation basically received investment. Then one day the creditors cut them off. xCloud is a new thing with the xCloud Foundation. There's probably a, a much better story that one could tell if one went out for a, a beverage with the people behind this. Sugar CRM and sweet CRM. If you decide to quit doing open source when people depend on you, they will fork. Sugar CRM basically said, we like to make money. We're going to stop development on the open source version. And I know lots of you depend on it because it's a great alternative to Salesforce. People said, no, we're not going to pay you money. We're just going to fork and we call it sweet CRM. OpenBSD and NetBSD. OpenBSD is a very focused fork. Theo Durant decided he wanted to make a much more secure NetBSD, so he forked. From a Red Hat standpoint, um, I'm sure they, they love that Oracle Enterprise Linux basically rebuilt CentOS. CentOS is basically RHEL for people without subscriptions that even Red Hat is quite happy for you to use. OEL is the hostile rebuild of, of CentOS. I presume there are many people here with an Android phone. Maybe not everybody is using a Pixel phone. Or, or maybe to be fair, there's a Nokia, Nokia also apparently now ships um, Android that's pure. But however, most of you probably use Android that's unpure. And uh, they're basically forked Androids. Your user experience is affected. The upgrade cycle varies. Um, and there's fragmentation in the market. And I'm sure if you're all following the whole Cambridge Analytica fiasco, you're also realizing that if you're using older versions of Android, the Messenger app probably uploaded all your phone calls to the cloud. Bitcoin. How many of you here came here for the cryptocurrency aspect of things? <laughs> OK, good. There's another track for that. However, um, Bitcoin 
and uh, and other cryptocurrencies, they can they can do a, a hard fork. They can basically think of a permanent divergence in a blockchain, and it, uh, it can occur with upgraded nodes and non-upgraded nodes, and then the non-upgraded nodes will not be able to validate nodes for the future, and then they use a consensus mechanism to say, hey, okay, we've moved to this new standard, maybe. And you can have a, a regular hard fork and also a soft fork in the cryptocurrency world. And if you Google forks, it turns out it's a great way of printing money. So every, if, if you decide today to create Bitcoin for Asia, you could. If you decide to create Litecoin for Asia, you could. In fact, the holders of the existing Bitcoin will get access to other things. So Bitcoin and Bitcoin Cash was something that something ha something like this happened, and you actually you virtually start printing money, but you don't actually print like der derivative money, right? You print forked money. And again, it's a how do you pick a winning fork? Those who can't obviously remember the past will probably repeat it. So one thing's for sure: why are you forking? The mere existence of a fork isn't what hurts a project, rather it is the loss of developers and users. So if everybody decided to switch to Bitcoin Cash and, and, and stop Bitcoin, Bitcoin would die. This is an extract that I've taken from Carl Fogel's book, Producing OSS. You can get it uh, online for free as well. Your real aim really is to minimize the harmful effects of a fork. So generally speaking, a branch is definitely better for development to continue in both directions. Whereas forks generally slow development in one side. So if you look at the Emacs Axi Emacs example, pick a good name that focuses on values. Hence the whole new M in lamps scenario. Takeaways: If you're going to pick a winning fork, the community matters. Your developers matter. Never ever annoy your community. Work with them. Harness them. Don't alienate them. No matter what you plan to do, your developers are really king. They're going, to, they're going to push you. If you're, if you're going to choose a cryptocurrency to, to, to back, make sure they've got good developers behind it. Otherwise, it's probably one of those scams. You want to limit end user friction, make it easy for people to get on board. You also want to make sure you're fairly well funded because that's part of the sustainable development method methodology, right? It's getting much harder for you to get, say, if you decide to start a foundation, get tax exempt status in the US uh, any longer. Go with another organization like the Linux Foundation or something, an umbrella organization. Think if you need a contributor license agreement as well. And I hate to tell you, you only fork after all other options are exhausted. You don't fork because you think I'm going to print money. That's a really bad idea to fork. Forking for the sake of forking is very, very silly. Have a clear fork focus. As a user of a uh, when you're choosing a branch, you've got to think about the innovation that's happening today. You definitely have to think about vendor lock-in because it turns out that even in open source, you could be vendor locked in without you really, re really realizing it. Think about the features you need today as well as tomorrow. Look at the support ecosystem around it as well. No point using a fork that nobody supports or just one company supports. And you can be smart about these things. Right? Look at website changes. If they've taken money to fork, uh, you can obviously look at web.archive.org to see if they're spending money developing software or they're developing websites, unless that was the purpose of the fork. And uh, remember, venture funding has pitfalls as well. Sometimes things fail. So um, with that, I never like X386 or Xorg and the myriad other forks that even exist. So maybe the best takeaway is, is a branch better than a fork? Probably yes. Um, but if you're going to do something, make sure you have a really clear fork focus. If your focus of a fork is ego, ego is a really bad motivator to do anything. Ego is truly an enemy for if, if, if you're going to fork software. Okay, uh, I think I'm out of time, right? <laughs> for listening. <laughs> and I'm open to questions at the back, <laughs> outside. <laughs> oh. The next speaker is here, okay, so...